It's not responding. Oh, okay. Okay, we're recording. <coughs> uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Hans Wenzel from uh, UCSD to give a talk today. So uh, uh, Professor Wenzel works on the factor theory, um, representation theory, tensor categories, and low dimensional topology. And he made a great um, contribution to these uh, areas. Uh, so his topic today will be uh, module categories for uh, SUN at level K. Uh, Hans, please. All right. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to give a talk here. So, all right. So, as you say, here, <clears throat> what the title says, we want to classify model categories for S U and S sub K. I will sort of explain what this is. So, so now there is an abstract classification of model categories has been achieved to a large extent now by work of Terry Gannon and Eddie Mitchell and others already before, but I think those are the ones who uh, achieved sort of the most recent breakthroughs. And this is given by something called modular invariant, which is essentially certain matrices with, with, with integer coefficients. So this is mostly just a combinatorial problem. Uh, but then having this, there's still the problem of finding an explicit description of these uh, module categories. And some of them were kind of um, mysterious. And again, I explain this in, in detail. And so basically the point of this talk is that for a large class of these module categories, we can use the combinatorics known for certain embeddings of Lie groups to describe this. Of, of course, it will not be the same, but it will be related. So that's uh, the very rough outline. So let's get started with some general stuff here. So probably most of you or everyone here knows this, but let me just uh, fix notation here. So we assume we have a nice tensor category. It should be semi-simple, rigid. The, our home spaces are C vector spaces. So then a model category M of C is a C category with a function uh, which are called tensor from M cross C to M, which satisfies the usual associativity conditions, which I am not going to write down, but uh, which will not be that important here. So some of the examples here are just say you have a, a uh, two groups, H embedded in G, it should be finite or could be compact groups. Then the, we can make the representation category of the subgroup into a module category of the uh, represent, uh, representation of the big group by a very simple method, namely by the restriction functor. So if we have an uh, a representation here of the subgroup M and a representation of the big group X, then the module action given here by this tensor sign is just given by the ordinary tensor product of H representations where we tensor M with X viewed now as an H representation. So this is really a pretty easy example, but it will be, uh, uh, it, it's a good model. And of course, coming from subfactors, uh, <clears throat> uh, there's also a st standard example for uh, embedding of uh, type 2 1 factors, could also be type 2 uh, 3 1 factors or uh, more general. So if you have this embedding, then we can form tensor powers M over N. So we take the nth tensor power of M by taking the tensor product of M over the sub factor N. And so C then is just the category of N, N by modules generated by such tensor powers. And the module category is the category of M, N by modules. Obviously we have left and right actions on this guys. And so then we also have a very obvious right module action on this, because if you tensor an MN bimodule by an NN bimodule, 
we get again an M n bimodal. So this is again a pretty, uh, at least in principle, pretty easy example. So now how do we describe or classify such model categories? So one of course, again, we have fusion rules, which is again, is pretty straightforward. So, so for simplicity, we only assume that we have uh, finally many irreducible modules in our model category, as well as in our tensor category up to isomorphism. So then, of course, if I had tensor and MI, a simple uh, model object with a, a, an object of the category, it decomposes into a direct sum of uh, simple modules. And with multiplicities AIJ. And so then we can form from this an, an, an M by M matrix, AX. And this gives us a representation of the fusion ring of the big category, which is called a NIMRAP representation. So this essentially describes the fusion rules. And the probably deeper going uh, thing is <coughs> by using uh, this description via algebra objects. So now again, an algebra object a in, in C in our tensor category K is just an object with two canonical morphisms. One is embedding of the trivial object into A. And so, so the trivial object is a, a direct sum of A. And we have a multiplication morphism from A tensor A into A. And of course, this should satisfy natural conditions like uh, this should be uh, uh, the multiplication should be associative, which uh, I wrote down here in the morphism. So, so if we have uh, three copies of A, it doesn't matter whether we apply our multiplication map first to the first two copies or to the second and third copy, we get the same result. Similarly, we can define an A module, which is just an, an object Y in C, for which we can define a, a, an A action on it. And the A action is given again by a morphism from A tensor Y to Y, which again satisfies the usual associativity constraints. So basically, you know, if you look at the, the lowest line, the, the obvious thing A1, A2 tensor Y should be the same as the right hand side. And then you just write it out in terms of this maps and then you get the identity uh, in the line above. Okay, so this is all um, just some basic abstract nonsense. So now the important thing about this is that the theorem by Ostrich that we can characterize a model category via categories of A models. So that means uh, we have this theorem here for every model category M of C exists an algebra object A in C such that M is isomorphic to uh, the category of A left modules. And so again, here we assume we have a right action on this. All right, so let's look at examples. So one is, okay, let's go back to our old example of uh, M to be the representations of a subgroup. Then we have the, uh, what is the algebra object in this case? So the, we, can, we can pick as an algebra object, the functions on the cosets of uh, the left cosets of G mod H. So this is, so in this case, it's clear what are the, what is the multiplication? It's just multiplication, uh, the ordinary way how we multiply functions just by pointwise uh, multiplication. 
So the, the usual multiplication for functions. All right. Now, of course, we would also like to know how this um, looks like as a, as a C object. And so it's known that this is just given the algebra A as a, as a G module is just given by inducing the trivial representation of uh, H up to the, the big group. So let's see, like for instance, uh, for our first example, say uh, let's take a subgroup HS2 and a big group S3, symmetric groups. Then A would be given as a, a direct sum of the trivial and the two dimensional representation. And you also see if you add up the dimensions, you get three, which is the index of S2 in S3. Now, the same could sort of go also for infinite groups. Also, I mean, this would be more complicated. And I just uh, write down this example here because it will be important later uh, for describing our model categories for fusion categories. So let's take for H, the orthogonal group. And for G, the unitary group, uh, N by, uh, group uh, of dimension N. So unitary N by N matrices here, here the orthogonal N by N matrices. So then this is an old result, which I think goes back to maybe a little word. Uh, so if it uh, induces up the trivial representation to G, then this is a direct sum of irreducible representations of UN labeled by Young diagrams, lambda, with the following two properties. On the one hand, lambda here should have at most n, n rows. And the other thing is that each row has only an even number of boxes. So that's the, the combinatorial result. So, okay, I mean, one could also state the other way around. These are all the representations which restrict the orthogonal group contain the trivial representation as a sub representation. Okay, so this is uh, an, a combinatorial result, which this uh, for coming from representation theory. So in, in principle, you know, one can calculate uh, this. Another uh, example would be that, uh, let's go back to our subfactor example, where M is the uh, category of MN by modules for N and M. So then the algebra object is the most obvious thing one could think of, namely it's the big factor viewed as an NN by module. So M, you, this is again an algebra object, and again, it's clear what the multiplication here is. It's just M is an algebra. So we have a natural multiplication map in, in, uh, in our algebra, which is also an NN by module map. So, so this would be two, two simple examples for algebras. All right. So these are quite general results. So. We now want to concentrate to a special class of tensor categories called modular tensor categories and modular invariants. Okay, I'm not going to this, uh, write down all the axioms for modular tensor category. It, it has a braiding in particular, it uh, has many nice properties. It's semi-simple, that's rigid. So what we need here is the following. So C is semi-simple and it has finitely many irreducible representations of irreducible objects. 
And so we fix here label set lambda, which labels this uh, the irreducible objects up to isomorphism. So then having this, we can form a vector space uh, whose basis is labeled by this index set. So we have as many, so the dimension of this vector space is equal to, to the number of irreducible objects up to isomorphism. And then uh, the, the property why we are interested in and which gave it the name modular tensor category is that a modular tensor category allows a canonical representation of the modular group SL2Z on this vector space. So of course, these are the two by two uh, matrices with uh, with coefficients uh, with integer coefficients and determinant equal to one. Okay, so we have this representation. So we now can define what is a modular invariant. A modular invariant M is a, again, a lambda cross lambda matrix. So I mean, uh, such that M commutes with SL2Z, with the SL2Z representation. And all entries of M are non-integer, uh, are, are non-negative integers. And moreover, it's normalized such that it's zero, zero entry, which is the zero is the label for the trivial representation so that it's zero, zero entry is equal to one. So then the theorem which we are going to use is you know, that if we have, uh, if M is a model category of, uh, of, a, of a modular category, then we obtain a canonical modular invariant M. And also I have outlined here the, how does one calculate this, this uh, matrix M, which I don't know, this may be, uh, I'm sure this is known to, to at least some people here, but let me just briefly uh, say, how does one obtain this matrix uh, M? <clears throat> so there is a canonical way Okay, I wrote it down here. M lambda mu is the dimension of the home space of two AA bimodules, alpha, which are alpha plus X lambda and alpha minus X mu. Okay, let me briefly outline this, how, how, how are they obtained? So, okay, given an object X, in our category C, uh, we want to construct an AA bimodel. So what we do first, we tensor this with A. So this makes it obviously into an A left module where the left action is just given via the multiplication um, morphism for A. We can also make it into an A right module, alpha plus X, essentially by using the braiding, which moves the A to the other side. And uh, so I wrote it out here. So alpha plus X tensor X, this is isomorphic as I see, object to A tensor X tensor A. So then using the braiding morphism, we can interchange this, so we can move uh, A and X, such that we, we can now apply our multiplication map and so we get an a back A tensor X, which is isomorphic to our alpha plus X. Now, because of braiding, we have two possibilities how to do this. Uh, we can either take you know, this braiding here, which I drew uh, as a picture here on the last line here, or we can uh, use the opposite braiding here. And so we get two, objects which may or may not be isomorphic. So in general, they are not isomorphic. And, and so hence we, 
And so now, hence now the uh, the entry of the of the M is given via this home space. All right. So what's the point of all of this? So if you have a, a modular tensor category to classify modular categories, uh, we first have to look at what are all possible module invariants of C. All right. So now let's, uh, uh, after all this abstract nonsense, let's uh, turn now to some concrete examples. So we look at this modular categories S, U, N, sub K, the fusion categories. So they are, can be fairly easily described as follows. So the simple objects, X lambda, are labeled by Young diagrams with uh, less, with at most N minus one rows, and such that lambda one is a, uh, the first row is less, uh, has at most K boxes. So basically these are all Young diagrams which fit, in, uh, fit into a rectangle with side lengths uh, n minus one and k. Then usually the object which will correspond to the vector representation as n is usually then given by the one box Young diagram. And so we get the following tensor product rules as, as written here. So, so if I have an object labeled by a simple object labeled by uh, the diagram lambda, and I tensor it with X, the element corresponding to the vector representation, I get a direct sum of objects labeled by Young diagrams mu, which can I obtain by adding a box to lambda. Now we are also allowed to, to add a box in the in the nth row, which then uh, uh, would correspond to the diagram where we uh, remove the leftmost column. So, so you can uh, see it written out here. So in, in this line below this formula. So then uh, it was shown uh, in an old paper that essentially one can classify all this, this uh, tensor categories with this fusion rules. So they are classified by uh, Q, which is a primitive n plus k root of unity, and theta, which is an nth root of unity. Basically, the theta corresponds to a, a twist of the associate via a three cycle of z mod n, but this will not be important here. All right, let's then do it. Uh, uh, let's do two examples in, in, in greater detail. First, for n equals two, uh, the objects are given by the one row Young diagrams going from the empty one to the K, uh, to the Young diagram with K boxes. This, uh, uh, and the tensor product rules are just uh, given by this formula here. So it contains at most two objects. And graphically can be described just, you know, if you form a graph with uh, the a, a n graph, or I guess it should be here, a k plus one graph, then uh, if you tensor the object labeled by m, then it's a direct sum of its two neighbors. What are the module invariants here? This was essentially already, I mean, the module categories were essentially already classified in an old paper by Goodman de Lahab Jones without using that notation. And so we have what I would call the non-exceptional ones because uh, they <laughs> appear for infinitely many case. The, the tr one is of course, is the identity matrix, which is obviously a modular invariant. And the other one is uh, I plus T, where T is the reflection in the middle of this A M minus one graph, which you, you see here indicated. 
And this only works if k is even, but again, this will not be so important. And also, there are three exceptional modular invariants corresponding to the graphs is 6, 7, and 8, which are at level, uh, let's see, 10, 16, and 28. And the numbers are a little bit nicer if you add the, the rank of it. So 2, then it's 12, 18, and 30. And, and so, so I, I only wrote down here as an example, the modular invariant in the E6 case that so where it is the modular area uh, invariant is given by T plus T squared, where T is a permutation matrix or, uh, which uh, interchanges the trivial object with six, uh, the object laid by four with 10 and the object laid by three with seven. So it's, well, okay, it's actually not a permutation matrix because it maps some objects to zero, like one, uh, one is mapped to zero. So the main point here is actually you now, uh, we are talking mostly here about the non-exceptional ones. So let's look at what does it look for n equals three. So there are the objects are labeled by uh, Young diagrams with two rows and at most K boxes in each row. So you can uh, arrange them here in a sort of like Pascal triangle here. So this goes down to uh, uh, the diagram with uh, K boxes in the first and second row. And also the tensor product rule can be uh, nice to describe graphically as so via this graph here. So basically, if we want to tensor a representation here, then we just, uh, you know, we, we put it into this Pascal triangle, add all these arrows here, and, and we, we write down whatever is allowed uh, to exist, which is in this triangle. So here's an example, X, uh, the, the two row thing tensor with X, you know, you're, yeah, you can go down to the left, you can go to the right, but you cannot go up because there's nothing up there. So we get this. Okay. So what are the modular invariants here? So we already see here some, uh, uh, this has some nice symmetries here, this triangle. And so the non-exceptional ones are closely related to this symmetries. Namely, one can show that uh, one of them is related to the rotations by 120, uh, 120 degrees. So, which uh, one can, uh, uh, this can be achieved by tensoring via the object here in, in this, uh, in this left down corner. This is again a, an invertible object. So it's, um, so it permutes this object and uh, it corresponds to a 120 degree permutation. Using the, so this is one symmetry. The other symmetry is the reflection in the middle of uh, the axis here. So if we, if we draw a vertical axis here, in this triangle and we reflect about this. <clears throat> this also gives us a matrix and this matrix co uh, corresponds to mapping uh, an object to its dual object. Now using this guys, we can get four non-exceptional modular invariants. So one is of course the identity, then the second one, uh, which are called O, is just we average over the rotations. So the identity plus the rotation plus T squared. Then I call, uh, we have C, the reflection at the central vertical axis. I use C because this is usually called charge conjugation in the physical literature. And of course, if O and C commute with uh, the M2 action, then also CO commutes. And it's not hard to, to check that 
also this satisfies the condition that the O oh, zero zero entry is one. Okay, so these are four uh, uh, infinite series. So they <clears throat> so they work essentially for, for infinitely many k's. I mean, uh, so essentially the charge conjugation works for all k, and and I forgot now whether there's any condition on k for the rotation, but I I don't think there is. So I think they all act for all possible k's. They work. Okay, fine. So we have this, but so now the problem now is what does it say about our module category? Can, what can we say about the, the, the corresponding uh, module category? And a priori, I don't think there's even a general theorem which tells us that such module categories always exist for every module uh, invariant. So I think this has been, it's true now for uh, S-U-N-K, which I think Kane, Kane and Eddie Mitchell uh, checked this. Uh, all right, so the question is, describe the corresponding module categories and determine the fusion rules and determine uh, some algebra object which would describe this. Of course, I mean, if M is a trivial uh, modular invariant, this is easy because then this, this is just the category itself uh, viewed as a module over itself. So this is no big deal. What about if, if M is O? Now I used O for something called orbifold. Here, the algebra is just the sum of uh, the ends of the of our an graph, so it's the trivial plus the uh, rep, uh, the last allowed representation, which is again uh, uh, dimension of dimension one an invertible uh, uh, object. So a essentially corresponds to uh, z mod two, and for n equals three, it's just uh, the algebra would be the direct sum of the three corners of our triangle here. So, so this, this, and this. And, and here this algebra will correspond to Z mod three. And essentially the objects correspond to orbits under this group actions. So, so this, uh, so, so for M equals O, these are well understood, so. The question is, what about C and CO? So now, but like a long time ago, like more than 10 years ago, I, I'd, I had a, quite a naive approach, a, a idea of how to uh, find module categories without really knowing about this stuff, which, which I should have, but I, I didn't. So, Essentially, so I pr proved there exists module categories for S to N K, and there are some technical conditions. So here K should be even with an algebra, which uh, labeled by a direct sum of X lambdas, where lambda are in the labeling set satisfying that two divides every every uh, the number of boxes in each row. And an additional condition was also that the number of boxes everywhere uh, of the whole uh, Young diagram should be divisible by N. Now, this looks kind of familiar to this example, which I wrote at the, at the beginning, namely that two has to divide the number of boxes in each row. This appeared also exactly in, let's see, where did we have it? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, for the example with here, here, 
f r x. This condition that two divides the number of boxes in each row appeared also in in this induction of in the algebra for the uh, for the model category uh, corresponding to the subgroup O n of U n. So this should be related. And in, in some sense, it, uh, it's not surprising because uh, I, I will tell a little bit later how I, how I got to this thing. So we see here that the algebra where is it? Uh, yeah, the algebra constructed here could be viewed as a kind of fusion version of the algebra coming from the subgroup O n into U n, or one could also say S O n into S U n, but that's uh, don't worry too much about the combinatorics. Yeah. Similarly, if n is even and k is arbitrary, one, ca one actually gets a second algebra where now again n has to divide the number of boxes of the young diagram and now two has to divide the number of boxes in each column so it's kind of like a transposed version and this uh, corresponds to the restriction of the un to the symplectic group but um, again this will not be so important here, here because I don't, uh, I don't want to talk about all possible examples. Okay, so and now for n equals, uh, so this was true, I guess, for a pretty general, for as I said here, for and the part one was true, uh, showed for arbitrary big N. And uh, part two was shown for arbitrary big and even. Okay, now for n equals three, this results were also obtained later uh, by Evans and Pew. And moreover, they also found uh, the algebras for n equals three and k odd. Now, if you look at this here, uh, that uh, our case here in part one, uh, we had to assume k even. So, so they obtained a complete description of all possible algebras of model categories, even for exceptional ones about which I will not talk here. And so in their case, so, for k equals even, I already said what the result is. So this would be uh, the result I obtained is here on the on the right uh, upper corner here, model invariant for CO. And so uh, Evans and and uh, Pew also obtained this for k even. Uh, let me see, what did I write? Oh, for k odd. And for k odd, the algebra is in some sense even easier because the algebra is just the direct sum of all irreducible objects in this. So, and so what the observer also the, uh, if you look at these two columns, then they are almost the same. The only reason is on the rightmost column, this is a subset of the of the Young diagrams on the leftmost uh, on, on the left column. And the condition is that here are only Young diagrams allowed whose boxes are divisible by three. So this is in some sense, you could view this parallel to this orbifold and trivial case. So, so and in any case, so we have a, a complete description of 
of this module uh, of the algebras for module categories in this case. All right, so some observations here. Okay, the first one is already this, uh, what I already said essentially, that the algebras here can be viewed, uh, the, uh, the algebras here in, in this fusion uh, 10 uh, category case can be viewed as truncations or of algebras which appear from natural embeddings of orthogonal groups into unitary groups. And in part two is also what I already said. Okay, now what about any other cases? So in this lower case where the algebras allows everyone, you could not, uh, oh, sorry, let me do this again. Now, for the odd case here, uh, originally there was no interpretation in terms of an embedding of uh, Lie groups. However, but in a more recent uh, work, which uh, will appear in 2023, and uh, so uh, we considered the uh, inclusion of uh, the symplectic group n minus one into S u n for n odd, and. So then one could show in this case that this embedding SPN minus one into SUN also allows a Q deformation. And uh, so hence it allows a module category of the quantum group, which is a deformation of this embedding here. Now for N equals three, one can show that uh, this corresponds to the case for Q, a, a certain root of unity, where one mods out via negligible objects. So uh, it is expected that this will also work for other N odds and that we can get model categories also in the fusion case. So this unfortunately uh, is, seems to be a little trickier than the other cases to prove this thing. And I got kind of a little distracted by other stuff. So, so this hasn't been checked yet for n bigger than three odd. Now, I had the fortune that uh, Kane Eddie Mitchell was visiting at San Diego for a year. And so I learned about uh, his work where he has classified model categories uh, S, U, N, K. And so essentially he, he can show that uh, this uh, uh, given by this model invariance and also using a results of Terry Gannon uh, can get a complete classification for uh, uh, N less equal than seven. And, <clears throat> and also, he can classify what are all those, uh, what they call non exceptional invariants, modular invariants. So now, essentially, all this non exceptional modular invariants can be realized as truncations of embeddings of certain Lie groups. And so I have. Uh, so let me first uh, say where is this? Yeah, sorry. I mean, I, I, I wished I could have written this a little bit nicer, but I ran out of space. So, so let's, let's go over uh, Kane's result slowly. So roughly speaking, we look at all devices of D uh, of, of our N, if S U N. For each device of D, one obtains two modular invariants. One of them is an orbifold, which is easy to describe. It's an orbifold. Uh, yeah, so I wrote it. I wrote it down here. 
uh, yeah, if you look at this corner here, it's an orbifold with respect to the subgroup of Z mod N of order D. And also the algebra is fairly easy to describe. It's essentially given by the objects, a direct sum of the objects corresponding to the subgroup. The second one, it would correspond to the CO, which we have. And it, this is given again by those X lambdas, where the, the set lambda is given by this uh, inducing up from H to SUN, where H is a subgroup. And the number of Young diagrams are divisible by D. So this is a very nice, I think, uh, in my opinion, and also I think it came up here, this uh, would be a very nice result, which we think is true in general. And let me just uh, I write down here in this table. So for which cases do we have uh, to choose which subgroup? So if N is even K, even you take ON into SUN or SPN into SUN. So there are two possibilities. There's actually one extra module category. So that's, if N is even K is odd, then we take the symplectic group embedded into SUN. If N is odd on K is even, we take SON into SUN and N odd, K odd, we take this inclusion here. So, yeah, so in some sense, we can, uh, if this, if our conjecture is true, and it has been proved in, in, in a number of cases, now we would have a, a very nice, I think, conceptual description of all this uh, algebras. And okay, so this would be basically the, the result, or, or rather conjecturally, so the result has been proved uh, for yeah for the n even k even and uh, for d equals n. So that would be a case. And yes, anyway, for, uh, if someone is interested, I'm happy to 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 tell tell him exactly which cases are proved and which are not proved. All right. So maybe a little bit about uh, proof. As I said, the method is kind of old. This is already what I used like 10 years ago. So let me briefly, uh, very uh, somewhat vaguely uh, indicate how this goes. So we start out here uh, with, the, so we pick our subgroup H according to, to this uh, table here. And we, we take V to be the n-dimensional representation of uh, SUN. So then we look at uh, the, you know, the endomorphism space, uh, I mean the committant uh, on, v, uh, <clears throat> on V tensor N of the SUN action which of course is embedded into the committent of the subgroup. The Q deformation of this is well known. We get uh, this one, which is given by the Hecke algebra. And yeah, I think I, I, I will write down the relation stuff uh, in a, below. So what we need is, we want to construct an algebra D and Q which is a deformation of our n sub h v tensor n and which contains the Hecke algebra. Now, of course, so what are the relations? Now, this is again where the subfactor background comes in handily because um, for subfactors, if one wants to construct subfactors, one always wants to have the commuting square condition. So we also go for this here. So we already know that, that the, the Hecke algebras have a canonical trace called the Markov trace. 
So we want to define an extension of this Markov trace to this DNQ, which satisfies the commuting square condition. Now commuting square condition just means a trace functional that induces a bilinear form on, on, on this uh, algebras and uh, uh, commuting square condition just means that projection onto the upper right corner and the lower left corner, that means the two intermediate algebras, that the projection onto this should commute. So, so essentially, and the amazing thing here is that uh, for these cases we consider, this really already pins down the relations for these extensions. So let me make it a little bit more concrete. Let me see where I have it here. So, uh, yeah, so we want to find this algebra D and Q, which should contain the Hecker algebra H and Q. And it should be a Q deformation for the, the, the centralizer algebra so of O n into S U n. So then we know in the classical case, two equals one, we only need to add one more generator to this generators of the symmetric group. So, so now the generators of the symmetric group become the generators of the Hecke algebra. So G1, G2, Gn minus one satisfy the Hecke algebra relations, which I wrote down here like this. So you satisfy a quadratic equation and they satisfy the braid relations where GI would correspond to this crossing here. Now, similarly, as in the classical case, the E is essentially a projection. It's, uh, no, it's E squared is equal N E where N is the Q number for N. And E should commute with the first one namely E is essentially just the sub projection of the eigen projection for Q. Uh, e commutes with generators of index bigger than two. And for E equals G2, it satisfies this relation. So this is all pretty straightforward. Now the, the kind of mysterious relation is now this uh, relation four which uh yeah and i still i think i will have to go back to this because i think I, uh, in order to prove this missing cases I, I think i probably need to understand this relations a little bit better so so essentially uh you know often a pictorial calculus would be uh, helpful Unfortunately here, one has to be careful because it doesn't uh, work in general. Okay, for E, the symbol would be this one here because that that's comes already from the classic case Brouwer algebra. This, so E, one could take a symbol this one. So then, uh, what I wrote down here, this relation here, uh, G2, G3, G1 inverse, G2 inverse is essentially given here by this uh, lower part of this graph here. So without this upper E, so. And so if you then multiply this again with an E, then the, we can identify this with, with this symbol. And one can show that this is indeed uh, if, if you square this guy, then you get n squared times the, the same thing. So this would be fine. However, when you use uh, change the braids a little bit like this, you will get something different. So in that sense, I mean, the, uh, and I think there's still something missing here to get a better understanding, but it would be not, I mean, if one could get some kind of, whatever planar description or, or uh, yeah, some more conceptual description of this. 
but anyway, I was already planning to look uh, at this again and, and I wished I would have had more time to maybe find something a little bit more conceptual. But it turns out anyway, that these relations really define the Q deformation of uh, which we want. And one can use this and to, uh, uh, to also construct subfactors and module categories. Okay, so this was uh, this was uh, this case for O and into S U N. All right, so I, I, I skipped that to get to this thing. So so let's just uh, wrap it up. So say so we have now de defined our D N Q. So then, how do we construct the uh, the module category of our a fusion category. This is again pretty straightforward. Essentially, so the objects of our M are just the idempotents of D and Q, modulo, the modulo negligible morphism, or here modulo the ideal, which is given by the annihilator ideal of the trace. But anyway, it's just uh, the morphisms coming from D and Q modulo negligible morphism. And the, of course, the, the fusion category S, U, and K can be constructed from the Hecke algebra, again, modulo uh, annihilator, uh, modulo negligible morphisms. And so then the embedding, so obviously HN is a sub algebra of HN. And so, which gives us also canonical embeddings for dm tends to hn into 2m plus n. And so, hence, this will define the model action. Because if here we have an, act, uh, an object of E of, of the model category, f is an object of our category. And then, E tends to f is again an idempotent in this a bigger algebra. The, which corresponds to an object in our model category. All right. So as I already said before, so we expect to get, uh, to get concrete descriptions for all non-exceptional modular invariants for S, U, N. And, uh, and again, they, they have the form O, D, which is the orbifold, respect to the, the COD for any divisor D modulo N. I mean, again, I, I threw a few subtleties under the carpet here, but this is roughly speaking uh, what it is. I mean, for N even there's a little bit more and, but I'll, I'll leave it like this for the time being. I, I guess I have talked a lot about now here the, the, uh, this non-exceptional model category. So I sh should probably say a little bit about the exceptional ones. So the, the biggest source of, of exceptional model categories comes from something called conformal inclusions. So, uh, and this was discovered by Fang Xi. And which I think, uh, yeah, but so in, in principle, a lot of the combinatorics is, is known, but I still uh, don't think that there is a general description of, say, the algebras of this. But it is known each conformal inclusion gives one. And the, if, if there's interest, I can explain what, what this exactly means. It has to do with representations of loop groups. There also exists another construction of exceptional module categories where planar algebras, like with Cheng Wei, constructed some of them uh, using in his paper Young Baxter relation planar algebras. And this is essentially, I mean, in principle, almost the same. Uh, I mean, it, uh, the idea is more or less similar to, to mine. Namely, he constructs extension of the Hecke algebras by a completely different method. And uh, then shows that this again gives uh, model categories. So, and, and these are related to some of the conformal inclusions. 
So finally, there also exists some other uh, exceptional model categories which don't seem to come from conformally inclusions or, or planar algebra, at least not uh, so far known. I think I, I, I probably wanted to write uh, conformal uh, inclusions instead of planar algebra. So, so sorry, that's a misprint. And so they were found by Terry Gannon and by Eddie Mitchell. And, and so, so I think Terry used some uh, vertex uh, operator algebra results for some of the results, uh, for some of these exceptional model categories. But in general, I mean, there are only finally many exception model categories exist for each uh, S, U, N, K. And this is again, uh, some recent results by, by I think, uh, uh, Andrew Shopire and Terry Gannon. So, all right. So I think I'll leave it with this. So, okay. Thanks for your attention. So, okay. Maybe I, I finished a little bit earlier. So yeah. sorry, but, but I'm happy to answer questions.